Good morning, everybody. Welcome to service this morning. Lovely to see everybody's smiling faces. Have we had an interesting week or a great week? Great week. Excellent. That's what I like. Enthusiasm. Um, I'd like to read. I'll draw destroy everything. I'd like to read from Psalm 27 this morning. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat of my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire of in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock, and now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Let us pray. You want John? There's a book there. And I've heard start from chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at our hands and have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. <clears throat> this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. May God bless this reading. looking at 1 John chapter 1 we've 
had a bit of a series on gems from John. Is that better? Okay. We've had a series on gems from John, uh, talking about some of the things that are contained in the Word of God in the book of John, and also from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the letters that John wrote, or epistles, that's what the word epistle means, is letter. So we're looking at some of the gems from the apostle, which is another name for disciple. The apostle John wrote some beautiful gems. Now, what is a gem? What's a gem? Any of you? A stone. A stone. Okay, so you where do you find them? Where do you find gems usually? Wrapped in gold on your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a gem on my finger. I've got a no, diamond on my finger. Where do you find them originally? In the yes. shop. Where do you find the gems originally? In the ground. In the ground. Okay. Now, just before we get into the message a bit, I've got something here. Noisy thing that I had. And we've used some of these before. What have I got here? Rock. In fact, we put them in bags at one stage. What have I got? Little gold rocks. Gold nuggets. You're worth, you're worth robbing. Sorry? You're worth robbing. I, I'm worth robbing. Not really because I'll, get, I'll let you in on a secret. That's just gravel spray painted gold. But if these were real gold nuggets, that'd be worth a lot of money, wouldn't it? I'm not sure what the latest value of gold is, but it's very, very expensive. Gold? Where do, and they find gold in the ground, don't they? And I was thinking about this. You know, we've got gems in the Bible that what do we have to do to know about those gems in the Bible? What do we have to do? Read. read. We have to read in the Bible, don't we? So if you found out, say these were real gold. If we found out there was real gold out on the property, what would we do about it? I wouldn't be. We'd have a working bee. <laughs> Everybody would be here. What would they be here with in their hands? Shovels. Sorry? Shovels. Shovels. Maybe some picks. Well, you know what? I've got to go. Yeah, years ago in Holiday Kids Club, we did a, we did a uh, kids club on the Bible as God's treasure, and we had as part of the activities, we had a sand pit. Do you remember that? That's going back a lot. And we were trying to find some little spades for the kids to dig with. And all we could find were these little, I think they're scoops meant for flour and sugar and things like that. But these were right in the sand pit. And the kids had to dig in the sand pit each morning for treasures that were buried. I can't remember all we did about that, but I remember we had a treasure hunt. In the <coughs> now, if you found gold on this property, is that what you would use to find the treasure? You'd be here a long time. Kev said bulldozer. <laughs> Who said? Jelly bulldozer. Kev. Kev said bulldozer. I was wondering what uh, Noah might say. I've brought something a bit bigger than this. It's a bit grubby. It's a bit grubby. What have I got? A shovel. That's right, Noah. Now, Noah, if you wanted to go and dig for gold now, please, we don't really know if there's any. There might be. But we don't know of any gold buried out here, so... I don't think it'd be worth you digging too much until we know there is some gold. But what's better than a shovel if you really found gold out on the property? How would you dig it up? Say it again. Mining loader. A mining loader. He knows where to go. Yeah, yeah, bring all over the big guns. <laughs> bring in the big guns. You, you get a big excavator, which is Ron, you get your friend here as it's been shoving, has shoved dirt. <coughs> like, would we, <laughs> would we all go out with one of these to dig up the gold? No. no. And we might have to use one of these if we didn't have an excavator. Might just be a lot of work, wouldn't it? But my goodness, nowadays with all of the big, big uh, machinery and things they have, they can dig through a lot of dirt in no time. And then they'd have to sift through that dirt, though, to find the gold, wouldn't they? Yes. Sometimes gold is in 
creeks and it's in water and I have to get a big uh, gold pan to, to find the gold. But at least you'd want to have a shovel, wouldn't you? Now what in the world's that got to do with gems from John? What do you think? What do you think it's got to do with We've just found out that there's gems in John. We found a lot of gems, some beautiful things it says in gem, in John. But we've got to get our shovel out, so to speak, and dig a bit. We've got to read the Bible. We've got to think about what it says. Dig into the meaning. Sometimes you have in your Bible some cross-references, and I found those very valuable as you read through the Bible. See what it says in other parts of the Bible. Because you know what? The Bible is amazing. And as we'll see this morning, something that David said hundreds of years before John wrote the epistle or the letter of 1 John, hundreds of years before David said very similar things. Different person, different time. Time of history. And... It's amazing what we can find when we dig a bit, dig into God's Word. If we really understand that God's Word is like gold, it's like gems, like treasure. If we really understand that, we're not just going to open it up and, oh yeah, very nice, and then go about our business and pay more, no more attention. Because God's Word is like gold. And we need to treat it as such. We need to read God's Word and let it speak to our hearts. And we see in 1 John, it tells us something very important in verse 4. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. God wants us to have joy. Is everything that happens in life joyful? <coughs> <laughs> Everybody's going to like this. Absolutely not, Pastor Lindsay just said. There's a lot of things, or mostly not. There are some wonderful, joyful things, but there's a lot of things that happen that are not joyful. So, do you think John is writing these things so that nothing bad is going to happen in our life? If we follow the Lord, nothing bad is going to happen. Is that true? <coughs> Who do we look to as our greatest example of that? Did everything go right for Jesus? The perfect Son of God who had no sin, who did only what was good, only showed care, caring and love, and yet he faced hard things too, didn't he? So we live in a world affected by sin, and we're going to find hard things in life. But what is the joy then? What joy? It says... We write these things to you that your joy may be full. What's it mean to be full of joy? To be full of peace no matter what's going on around us. To be full of peace no matter what's going on around us. That is true joy, isn't it? True joy isn't when everything's going fine. We all like things to go fine. I mean, we don't pray, Lord, give me some trouble today. <laughs> Well, I don't look to you. Yeah, you Although, you know what? Paul said that we need to be praising God for the, the trouble that does happen. We don't like hearing those words, do we? But God wants to give us joy that's beyond the circumstances of life. True joy. In Psalm 16, verse 11, David said these words, In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. In this first letter of John that we've just read, had uh, Eric read to us this morning, ten verses are jam-packed with some wonderful truths, some gems, some gold nuggets, so to speak. What is the fullness of joy that God wants to give us? First of all, he tells us in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. 
We're not going to have true joy in this life, in any of our lives, until we know His forgiveness of our sins. That's the first step. In that same verse, it goes on to say something else. <coughs> it says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and <coughs> to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God wants us to confess our sins to Him. He wants to forgive our sins. He wants to forgive us of those things we have said and done and thought that are wrong. He wants to forgive those things. And He will forgive them and forget them. As far as the East is from the West, it tells us in His Word, He removes our transgressions from us. So if you've done some really bad things and you're ashamed of, but you've confessed it to God, it's finished. It's over. There's the enemy of our soul, Satan, who will bring him up against us. But God won't. He will keep, Satan will keep saying, well, you're not much chop. Look what you did back to so-and-so. Look what you said. He will be, he's the accuser of the brethren, it tells us in God's word. He will bring them up, but God will not bring them up against us whatsoever. But there's a step after we have been forgiven. When He has forgiven us of our sins, we can then give our forgiven heart to the Lord for cleansing. What was it Jesus said to His disciples, who were all followers of His? Wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then you shall be witnesses for me. We need the cleansing of the Holy Spirit. We need the cleansing of that attitude of life that says, will I or won't I do what God wants? Will I or won't I? We need that cleansed so that God can use us. I thought, and I'll probably use this illustration, forgive me if you've heard it before, but when we, when we had our kids, interesting enough, we <coughs> never had to sit them down and teach them how to say no. Did you have to teach your kids how to say no? Why is that? How come we don't have to teach our children to say no? Or to stomp their little foot? I remember Anne, she's a lovely, a lovely lady. But when she was a little girl, she was very stubborn. You know, stubbornness is not a bad thing if it's channeled in the right way. But she was stubborn. And she'd say no as she stomped her foot. No! But you know, we didn't teach her that. We didn't have instructions, all right, Ange, one, two, three, stomp your foot and say no. We, we never told her to say no. How come? How come she automatically seemed to know how to do that? Why is that? With any child, not just Ange picking on her right now. She's not here, so I can do that. <laughs> but um, we are born with a nature, a stubborn heart, a nature that says no. And we need that dealt with. And that's what happened at Pentecost. We hear about the, the flames of fire, speaking in other languages. We hear about that part. But the cleansing was what those disciples needed. That cleansing from the will, I call it the will I or won't I attitude. You know, picking on Ange again, when she was little, we lived in a house that was set down off the road a bit. And it didn't have a fence around it. It was a busy road. It uh, was, wasn't a big lot of traffic, but it was a busy road. And she was toddling, and we had to, and we couldn't afford a fence, and it would have been really tricky. You would have had to do the entire yard. You couldn't really just put a fence along the road part because there weren't fences on either side at the neighbors. It would have been a big job fencing in that yard if we could have afforded it. We just had to train her that she was not to go up next to the road. She could run around in the yard, we had the front yard she could go in, but there was a tree there. And we made a rule that if she got to that tree, now I'm talking about toddler, if she went past that tree, she was in trouble. And she knew it. And back in the old days, you could smack your children and, you know what, God's Word says we need to do that actually. 
but we didn't beat her up. We just, if she stepped past that tree for her own protection, she'd get a smack on her neck or on her bottom. And she learned quickly that she was not to go past that tree. And we'd say, stop, turn around, come back. Those were the phrases we used. If she got up near that tree, but you know what she would do? She'd walk up to that tree, and she'd look at that tree, and then she'd look back at us, see if we were looking, and she'd put her foot out. You know, we'd say, stop, foot would come back. Not always real quick, but her foot would come back. Turn around, and she'd turn around. Come back, and she'd come back. Not always very willingly, but it took a lot of training, because we could have lost her to that thing. Right? So it was for her own protection. Anyway, this went on for a period of time. Went through this stop, turn around, come back session. Now and again. But after a while, she knew we meant business. And she knew there was something that wasn't going to be too comfortable that would happen if she tested us too far. But you know what? One day, we were at church. And we used to have services in a hall. We didn't have our own building. And we had to take all of the things to, to use at church in a rented hall, and it was on a four-lane road out in front of that library hall it was down in Tassie. And one day, when we were packing things up along with the couple that you met, Bud and Doris, a couple years ago, with, they had a little boy the same age as Angela, and later some other children, but one day, Ange and Bob went missing while we're packing things up into the van to take home, and I thought, where are they? And I went outside and my heart nearly stopped because there was Ange holding Bobby's hand walking to that busy road and it was much busier than our road at home. A four lane, very main connecting road and they were walking straight to that road and my heart stopped and I thought if I try to run and get them, they'll run. You know how kids do that sometimes when they're little. They think you're playing a game with them. And I just called out, stop, turn around, come back. And there was Ange with Bobby. They were headed to that. And then she was like doing the little, there's mom. Am I going to do it? She, you know, she turned around and I said it again, stop, turn around, come back. Thankfully, just before they got to that road. I don't know what was going on in her brain, but she's probably thinking, I'm in real trouble if, if I don't do what Mum says. And they turned around, she turns around at Bobby, and they walked back, and I had to go inside and tell, tell Doris what had nearly happened to her two children at that stage. So she needed to learn. She needed to know the boundaries. She needed to obey. And it tells us a third thing here about how we can have fullness of joy besides forgiveness of our sins, besides cleansing and empowering of the Holy Spirit, we need to walk in obedience to Jesus. Walk in obedience to Him. In 1 John 1, 7 it says, If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. We need to walk in obedience. Not always testing God out, oh, can I or can't I do this? Be ready to say whatever you want, Lord, that is what I want. That's what he wants of us. So that we delight to do his will. Whatever he wants is what we want. That we don't have to all the time be, stop, turn around, come back, <coughs> keep having God do that to us. We walk in obedience to what he wants. It says in another part of John in chapter 14, in the book of John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. It's pretty clear, isn't it? If it's hard to do what God wants you to do, then and, and you're struggling with obeying, you're not really loving him. That's what it says. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If a child really loves their parents, they'll do what they ask them to do. I know kids go through a time of 
testing their own abilities or their own will or I know kids have that adjustment time. But if you say, Mom and Dad, I love you, but you never do what they ask you to do, that's not real love, is it? If you love Mom or Dad, and they say, look, would you go and help Mom with those dishes? And you go, oh, I don't want to, and stomp your feet and go the other way. Is that real love? No, if you really love Mom or Dad, you'll do what they ask you to. I mean, if they asked you to do something bad, you wouldn't do that because God comes first. You wouldn't do something that God wouldn't want you to do, but we're not talking about those kind of things, are we? We're talking about everyday things. Mom or Dad says, I want you to do this. You just obey. That's what God wants you to do. God wants us to treat Him like that too. In 1 John 1, 3, it says, That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So, not only do we need to ask Jesus to forgive us, to fill us with the Holy Spirit, and to walk in obedience to Him, we need to love and live holy lives as a witness for Jesus. Love and holy living as a witness for Jesus. If we love the Lord Jesus and then tell other people about Jesus, but we don't love them, that's not a real witness, is it? Or if we say we love Jesus and we don't do what he says in his word, keep his word, then that's not a good witness, is it? So these are all parts of loving and serving the Lord Jesus so that we will have fullness of joy. Now, when it's all said and done, we probably know all those verses. Most of us probably could quote most of those verses. But the good thing about the Bible, it doesn't just tell us this, this, and this is what you should do. It gives us examples. So who's an example of someone we can look at who lived like this? And the interesting thing is the very man who Jesus had write these words is a good example. John himself is a wonderful example of someone who lived like that. Someone who loved the Lord. Someone who was filled with the Holy Spirit. Someone who walked in obedience. Someone who loved others and witnessed to others. Here's the example that we'll just look at briefly. Have you ever heard the saying, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You ever heard that expression? I was going to look and try to find out where did that come from. You know, like who, who said that first of you, they know. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. It made me think of Kev's Christmas pudding. Beautiful as they are sitting there after they're made, it's when you cut into them and put them in your bowl, maybe a bit of ice cream and custard on top. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. You really know what the pudding's like when you eat it, don't you? You know how yummy it is. Well, I don't know if that's where that saying came from, Kev's Christmas pudding. I think it might have come around before that. But um, the same is true in the life of a Christian. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. That doesn't mean we get eaten like a Christmas pudding. But the proof of what Jesus says and putting that into practice is in the lives of people who follow him. Does that make sense? If you say you're a Christian and you're not paying your bills, if you say you're a Christian and you're nasty to someone, if you say you're a Christian and you don't do what God says in his word, the proof of the pudding's in the eating, in the real experience. John was an ordinary person like you and me. He, he was one of the first disciples that Jesus called. Remember Jesus called some people to be his followers, to be his close workers, disciples, to, to work with him. John was one of those. Jesus called Peter, and then he called Andrew, his brother, Peter's brother, and then he called James and his brother John. And they believe because John is always put second, that that means he was the younger one. So there was Peter, 
Andrew, James, and John, they were fishermen. Jesus called them to be his disciples. So John was one of the early disciples, and they believed that he was the youngest of the disciples, different indications of that in the scriptures. And he referred to himself, some people think he was egotistical, because he, he called himself, in the Gospel of John, he called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, Jesus loved them all. And some people think, oh, he was a bit egotistical. I think, in fact, when you read the scriptures, he doesn't identify himself as John. He calls himself the one Jesus loved, not because he was egotistical, is my opinion, but because he was not wanting to, to big name himself. He didn't give his name. Now, you can take that at, at just my theory, but nothing else about John indicates that he was egotistical. If anything, he was a very humble man. But John was an example of someone who had the fullness of joy. Another thing we know about John, he was a, a Galilean fisherman. His, his father was Zebedee, a fisherman, and his mother was Salome. And interesting, we hear about his mother a couple of other times in the Bible. She was among the slaves. So not only did Jesus have disciples, those 12 that helped him, but there were a group of women who helped Jesus and the disciples because they had they traveled around, they had to find accommodation, they had to have food. And they were there was a group of women who helped the disciples. Salome was one of them, the mother of John. And one time there's a little bit of an insight into his mother because she went to Jesus and she asked, asked this of Jesus. She said, would you let my son sit on the left hand and right hand of you when you come into your kingdom? Some believe that, that she meant when, you, when we get to heaven. Others that because they thought Jesus was here to set up an earthly kingdom that she was talking about here on earth when, he, when Jesus becomes king. Will you let my, my sons, James and John, sit on either side of you? And Jesus kindly said to her, you don't know what you're asking. Are they ready to suffer with me what I'm going to suffer? And the other disciples had said they got annoyed with James and John's mother coming and asking this. And Jesus just kindly reminded them, you just look after one another. You show kindness. You show caring. And you can read about that. It's an interesting incident in Matthew 20. So that was an interesting insight into the life of John. That's what his mother was like. She wanted the best for her kids, like we all do. But she was asking a, a favor. She didn't realize the full implications of it. And John lived in an ordinary home. He lived in an ordinary time. And he lived in a place later on. At first he was in Galilee. When Jesus called him, and later he lived in Ephesus, a place that was known for false teaching. And there was things that happened, we read in the Bible, that they had to deal with the false teaching amongst the Christians in Ephesus. So John didn't have everything going fine for him. He lived in an ordinary home, met ordinary sort of things in his life, but he followed Jesus with all of his heart. And when we see how Jesus had James and Peter and James and John as his little inner circle of three disciples. It wasn't because Jesus loved them more than the others in practical terms. If you went to visit someone or heal someone and all 12 disciples had to go with you in that circumstance, it would have been a bit crowded for one thing. Those three were their closest to Jesus and John was one of those three. And Jesus let them have the privilege of being with him when he was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration that we can read about in the Gospels. And they were there with him in the garden before he faced the cross. He asked those three men to stay with him and pray with him. John was one who actually saw what was happening in the trial of Jesus and at the cross. Only disciple mentioned to being at the cross. And remember how Jesus, from the cross, asked John to look after his mother? That would have been someone he would have trusted to look after 
his mother Mary. And that was John that was in that role. It was John, along with Peter, that ran to the tomb when they heard Mary Magdalene say that Jesus was alive. John outran. I think that's a little in, interesting little incident that he records. Even though Peter was also running, it was John that got there first, but it was Peter that went into the tomb to see the empty grave clothes. But John lets us know that he got there first. I think it, probably because he was younger and maybe a bit quicker running than Peter. Ordinary people. John was an ordinary person and the only one of the 12 that we understand lived to die a natural death. <coughs> and even in his being banned to the island of Patmos for about 10 years, it was there that God gave him the revelation that is recorded in what we call the book of Revelation of what will take place before Jesus returns. So what an interesting man who in his elderly years after he, a new leader came in and let him back out off of the island, another leader let him go back home and he spent his elderly years, some people believe he was quite um, crippled, not able to get around and they had to carry him from place to place and there's a record of him saying to people, love one another, just as he says in, in his words that he's written in the Bible, love one another. We can have fullness of joy, just like John had, like others who have followed the Lord, we can have fullness of joy. Remember, joy is not the absence of problems but it's the presence of Jesus in our life. So no matter what may happen, we can have joy in His presence. Do you have joy in your heart? Do you have His joy in your heart? How do you get it if you don't have it? You ask Him for forgiveness of your sins, first of all, and then you ask Him to fill you with the Holy Spirit, to cleanse that will I or won't I attitude out of your life. And walk in obedience to Him and to share with others, live a holy life and to share with others about Jesus. Let's just pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can have your joy, that knowing you is joy, and that we can have the fullness of joy in our own lives. And I pray, Lord, for each one of us that you would help us to look at our own life, to stop and think, do I have the joy of the Lord in my life? Do I have his presence in my life? Help us, Lord, to know beyond a shadow of doubt that we are walking with you and sharing in your joy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, I just realized.